Hello, I'm David from David's Way to Health and Fitness once again. Today I want to talk about a book that I recently got, and uh, the title of it is The Barbell Prescription. It's uh, for strength training for life after 40, and it's written by Dr. Jonathan M. Sullivan and uh, strength coach Andy Baker. Now, you might be thinking, hey, I don't work out with weights. I might not be real interested in what you had to say here. But I, I really think you should listen up, you know. And, and this applies whether you're older. Older or hopefully, you know, if you're younger, I, I really want to reach you with this. And uh, what Dr. Sullivan talks about here is what he refers to as the sick aging phenotype. And uh, what he's getting at is, you know, the type, the type of people who age and they're sickly. And, uh, and sickly with a lot of preventable things. So I'm going to read some excerpts out of this. I'm going to discuss a little bit of it. And, uh, you know, I really hope... I really hope that y'all get something out of uh, what Dr. Sullivan has to say. I've been following Dr. Sullivan for yeah, 12 years or, or a little better now. Uh, he's a strength coach that I've uh, followed when I was real heavy into powerlifting, and uh, yeah, I've still been following him. He's, he's a medical doctor, and he's got a lot of really good things to say, not only about barbell training, but... Uh, about health in general as we age and things we can do to uh, to improve our health and of course a lot of it's uh, directly in, in line with what you know Brendan Sue and I already teach at David's Way to Health and Fitness you know we're, we're trying to help people not not just to lose weight but to, uh, to live a healthier life and of course living a healthier life you know uh, Weight loss is just a, uh, a positive byproduct of what occurs when you live healthy. So, without further ado, Dr. Sullivan writes, Getting older has never been easy, but if you had to choose one epic of history in which to embark on the fourth, fifth, or sixth decade of life, the current era would be your best option. Today's the best time ever in the, in the history of the world to be in your 40s, 50s, 60s, and older. But for a lot of people, it's a horrible time. He goes on to say, Never before has it been possible for so many people to live so long in so much comfort and security against so many ancient horrors and with so many teeth. Of course, every silver lining has a cloud. Aging in the postmodern era can result in either the healthiest seniors, and this is what we want to help you to become, is a healthy senior. Uh, what Brenda Sue can tell you, she works, you know, taking care of people in a nursing home, assisted living, you know, and, and there's a lot of people end up in these facilities, you know, just absolutely prematurely, and, you know, that's what we're trying to help you know, to prevent from happening for a lot of you out there that, that will take on, you know, healthier lifestyles. We want to help you with this. Moving on, though. Uh, aging in the postmodern era can result in either the healthiest seniors the world has ever seen or ghastly and increasingly common syndrome of maladaptive aging, which we call the sick aging phenotype. The sick aging phenotype is a complex of interrelated and synergistic processes in which the metabolic syndrome, muscle and bone loss, frailty, loss of function, and independence in an ever-growing stew of pharmaceuticals conspire to destroy the health and quality of life of the aging adult. And he goes on to talk about You'll we'll see just how badly things can go wrong for the aging adult in a world of wonder drugs, leisure, plenty, and peace. Um, he, he's so right in that, you know, 
we, we, the the miracles of modern medicine are just astounding. I, I can think I'll be 60 years old in a year, and I, I think about how far I've seen things come just in my lifetime. And then if you if you read anything on history, um, you know, this is a wonderful time to be alive. You know, I'm, I know we got troubles in the world and stuff. You know, and uh, you know, we can't do anything about those things, you know, as individuals, but we can do something about our world. We can do something to make our world better. You know, we, we can't always, we, we can't have an impact on everything that help, happens around us, but we can have an impact on ourselves. And the best way to have a positive input, impact on ourselves is to eat healthy and to get plenty of exercise. Move your bodies. You know, it, it, it really is. It's that simple. Eat healthy, move your body. Matter of fact, you know, th this is not a new concept. And you can go back to the biblical days. Uh, go back to the biblical days. In the book of Matthew. Uh, chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body and what you put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Uh, think about that for a little bit. A lot of times in life nowadays, we're just, we're hung up on the superficial stuff. You know, a lot of, uh, you know, getting hung up on, hey, you know, where's the popular place to go to eat? You know, who's got Taco Tuesday going on? You know, uh, things like that, you know. Um, head on down to the all-you-can-eat buffet, um, and we get into the superficial things, you know, things that really just don't matter in life, you know, because really what it comes down to is our health matters. If you ain't got your health, you don't have anything. And, uh, you know, you can go back to the Old Testament days, um, back when the book of Proverbs was written. It says in uh, Proverbs 23, 20 to 21. Be not among drunkards or among the gluttonous eat eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. Think about what that means. Back in those days, and really up to not that long ago in, in, in our current history, you had best take care of your health. You, you couldn't uh, you couldn't just lay about you know munching down on a carton of ice cream and you know eating your ice cream right out of the carton with a spoon you couldn't uh, sit there with a bag of chips and a soda pop you know watching Netflix you had to eat healthy because we didn't have modern medicine back then you had to eat healthy and take care of your body and that and, and they knew even you know 2,000 plus years ago you know not only to eat healthy and not eat too much that you had to move. You, you couldn't be slovenly. You, you had to get out and, and do things and protect your health. So anyhow, we get into uh, more into uh, Dr. Sullivan's book here. And, and he just he, he makes up a story, but there's a character in here that we're all going to recognize. We might recognize it in ourselves or somebody that we know and love. You might, uh, you might recognize this as being your mom or dad, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, friend, your minister at church, your rabbi, priest, your imam, um, just people that you associate with. We all know these, this, this type. And this hypothetical uh, people that, that he talks about here would be identical twin brothers. Genetically, these twin brothers couldn't be more similar. You know, they're they are identical twin brothers. Their their genes are the same. Yet they go on to have different lifestyles in their adult life. One goes on to eat healthy and uh, he gets involved in, you know, different sports and stuff like that. He exercises and he's able to have a really healthy body. The other brother, Phil, he falls into the trap that a lot of us fall into. 
lays about, eats too much, doesn't get enough exercise, and he suffers the health impacts of living that way. Folks, we see this all the time. You know, we, we've got a 68% uh, 68% of the U.S. population is either overweight or straight up obese. So, you know, with that kind of odds, you, you have to know somebody that falls into this category. And uh, if, if you don't know what phenotype means, uh, I'll just get on back, back to this. Phenotype is an unfamiliar but useful word. It's a biological term, a construction from the Greek phanon plus typos, or show plus type. It's the show type of an organism. The appearance, traits, behaviors, and overall structure and bio biochemical pe peculiarities we observe when we look at that organism. So, in this case, the organism he's looking at is this, the brother Phil. You got Will and Phil. Will's healthy. Phil goes on not to be healthy. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, like I say, you know, these two are identical twins. Everything should be identical, but, but for the fact that their lifestyles are different, uh, you know, he, he, he starts out, you know, talking about how, you know, they had a lot of similarities between the two of them when they were growing up, you know, but then you fast forward 55 years, and what, what has happened to the genotypes of Will or Phil? Nothing. They sh still share the, exactly the same genotype, but when we step out of our time machine, we find that their phenotypes are vastly different. Will has the more uncommon common phenotype. He's an avid sportsman, and I'm, I'm not going to read all that, but he's a sportsman. He exercises his body. He eats proper. Phil, on the other hand, he displays the more common phenotype. And like I said, you know, 68% of our nation has a problem here. So, you know, he's not kidding. That is a common phenotype. Somewhere along the line, he took up smoking, drinking, and lots of quality time with this big screen TV. How many of you know that guy? Or gal? Uh, he's planning on watching the entire third season of Battlestar Galactica this evening, or this weekend for the fourth time. To keep his edge, he drinks lots of Pepsi and keeps scrupulously up to date on his Netflix queue. Think about that. How many people do you know that wake up in the morning and, and they start drinking, you know, whichever soda pop of choice, you know, could be Coke, Pepsi, Mountain Dew, Dr. Pepper, generic, you know, whatever, it's all the same. It's just a bunch of sugary garbage. And, you know, it's no good for you. So, moving on here. He's a fiend for Domino's Pizza and Doritos. We know that person. He likes to cook with frozen ingredients and a microwave. Think about that. How many people use a microwave today? It just scares them to even think about trying to operate an oven. You know, uh, a lot of people like that. It's sad. Cooking's become a lost art. His body fat is through the roof. He's about 48% fat by weight, and he tips the scale at 283 pounds, about 70 pounds on his heavier than what his twin brother is. He doesn't like doctors, although he's known to make frequent trips to the ER for chest pain, fatigue, sore joints, or skin infection. He hasn't had a real erection since the start of the Obama administration. He has type 2 diabetes, arthritis, messed up serum lipids, and high blood pressure. He doesn't know it yet, but he also has a ticking time bomb in his left anterior descending coronary artery. Three years from now, this lesion will clamp off the blood flow to Phil's left ventricle in the middle of, di of a diehard movie marathon. He'll breathe his last breath in the cardiac ICU six weeks later, age 58. I, I know, you know, that this is, you know, just a made-up person, 
But it's a composite of so many people we know. Uh, these things that this that this character has, Phil, these things that he has are completely unavoidable. And you know, uh, sadly, you know, I mentioned you know how uh, it, we we see this everywhere, you know. Man, go to the all-you-can-eat all buffet. Look, just next time you go into an all-you-can-eat buffet, take a look around you. And then think about it. if somebody else walked in after you were seated, could they tell the difference between you and most of the people in there? Uh, just, just do it next time. Think about it. If somebody couldn't single you out as being different, you know, you're probably going to have a problem. Because if we're getting real, most of the people in all you can beat, eat buffet are going to be overweight. And we see this at uh, we see this at family reunions. We see this at potluck dinners. Uh, you know, even even in our church, you know, uh, our churches. I'm not saying you know yours or mine specifically, I'm saying generally, you know, we, we see this. We'll see this person that'll walk up to that potluck dinner, whether it's at a family reunion or a church function or whatever, and man, they're going to heap their plate just full of stuff. And then they'll go up and get seconds, and maybe even thirds. You know, uh, there's a lot of people out there, you know, when they get the, when, when, when they're given the option of having all you can eat, they're going to eat all they can. And uh, we all, we've all encountered this, even if we're being polite and we don't want to say anything about it. You, you and I both know that we've, uh, we've encountered somebody like that where we had to kind of take a double take at how much they were eating. And, you know, heaven forbid you get between this person and, uh, and that last piece of chocolate cake up there on the buffet table. <laughs> you, you might get trampled. Hey, Charlie, where you at? My cat coming in here to bother me. But, anyhow, moving on here. Phil is already dying, and he will spend six painful weeks in the hospital after his heart attack, battling cardiogenic shock, pneumonia, a nasty bed sore, sepsis, in all manner of wickedly invasive and painful inter medical interventions. His great final adventure comes to an end on his 43rd, 43rd hospital day when a thrombus breaks loose from the deep veins in his fat-laden, chronically underused legs. The clot takes the vena cava express to the right side of his heart, lodges in his main pulmonary artery, induces total vapor lock, and mercifully dispatches him from his miserable existence. Fortunately, Phil has Blue Cross, so his family doesn't get the $185,000 bill, which means Will can afford to go hiking in Scotland some 30 years later. Uh, Dr. Sullivan is an emergency room doctor. Dr. Sullivan has seen these things, you know, uh, on a... On, I'm gonna guess, you know, on a daily basis, you know, throughout his years as a medical doctor working in, you know, emergency and trauma. You get somebody, you know, it's, it's you know, dad, mom, grandma, grandpa, whoever, you know, they come in, you know, they're, they're brought into the emergency room and, and they're just deathly sick and they got all kinds of things wrong with them. And, and, and so many of these things can just be cured Maybe not cured is not the right word. I don't because I don't want to sound like I'm a doctor. I'm not. A lot of these things can be prevented through healthier living. In ages past, war, famine, and infectious diseases were the scourge scourge of mankind. Smallpox, diphtheria, cholera, measles, dysentery, plague, malaria, influenza, and pneumonia 
Meningitis, cellulitis, pink eye, tooth abscess, and other microbial diseases devastated individuals, populations, and even entire civilizations. And, and you know, we don't have that kind of problem anymore so much, you know, because of modern medicine, you know, in the Western world. You know, we've had all kinds of vaccines and stuff, you know, that's prevented us from getting all those things. But here we are, you know, we don't have, you know, we don't have to worry about smallpox or polio no more. Uh, but we, we've got other things that are just as deadly that have replaced those things. And uh, the, the problem is some of these things, they don't kill people in a hur hurry, actually. You know, it makes them very sickly for, for a lot of years, which, you know, makes your family, you know, you can be, you can put, leave your family massively in debt when you do pass away, you know, the, ho the hospital bills that are a result of overeating, eating too much of the wrong foods and not getting enough exercise. These are, you know, it's, it's very real issues. It affects, it affects people every day. Somebody, somebody in your life is being affected by this. And you get this, you get these people out there to say, it's my life, I'm going to live it the way I want to. The problem is, when you get sick to a point, it's no longer just about you. It's no longer just your life. I'm going to tell you from personal experience. I took care of a morbidly obese family member that was terminally ill. For a long time, his attitude was, it's my life. It's none of your business. It's my life. I pay my bills. I go to work. This, this, this has no impact on you. Until it did. Until we moved, in, moved him into our house to take care of him when he was terminally ill. We did this out of love. But, did... Did he ever stop to think when he was saying, you know, really, you know, what I eat, how I live my life is none of your business? Did he stop to think that at some point I was going to have to help him with his personal hygiene when he went to the bathroom? Man, you, you don't think about your best friend having to wipe your butt for you. You know, is it, is, is it still not my business? When I had to do that, was it not my business when I had to help the man with bathing? Was it none of my business when I had to help him getting dressed? Was it none of my business when his lymphedema was so bad in his, both of his legs that it was weeping fluid and his legs had to be cleaned up and rebandaged every day? Was that none of my business? You know, God love him. He was my best friend. You know, and, and and I did this. I did. I. We did what we had to do in my home, out of pure love. You know. But there, there's always a time, you know, when it becomes somebody else's business. You, you can think it. It'll never be anybody else's business. But there comes a time when it will be. And moving on here, uh, the sick aging phenotype is complex, but it it can be summed up in a few in a few words: metabolic syndrome, sarcopenia, and osteopenia, frailty, and polypharmacy. Each of these imposing terms invokes a monster lurking in a grim and altogether likely future for all of us. All of us. When he says all of us, that, you know, it goes back to like I was saying. You can say it's none of your, none of anybody's business how you live, how you eat, how you exercise, or how you don't exercise. But it affects everybody. Somebody's got to pick up the broken pieces behind your shattered life when you don't take care of yourself. Somebody has to. It's never just about you. 
So let's talk a little bit about metabolic syndrome. And I've written quite a bit about this stuff, but I'm, I'm going to give this to you from the doctor's uh, point of view here. Components of the metabolic syndrome. Number one, visceral obesity. Accumulation of fat around the internal organs. This change is highly correlated with the more visible tranquil obesity, uh, variously defined by the rather crude metrics of waist-tip ratio or BMI. That fat that surrounds your organs can kill you. You suffocate it all out. Moving on here, number two, insulin resistance and hyperglycemia. It's loss of cellular sensitivity to insulin signaling leads to numerous derangements. This includes diabetes or pre-diabetic state character characterized by poor serum glucose control. Diabetes can kill you, and usually before it does kill you, the doctor might have to take a scalpel and whittle off a toe, or maybe your foot, or your leg, or maybe both legs. Um, if it's bad enough, you know, uh, they may have to take the legs off entirely to where you're bound to a wheelchair. Otherwise, you know, maybe you'll end up, you know, with just a couple prostheses where you can still get around. Number three, hypertension, which is elevated blood pressure. The bigger your body is, the harder your heart has to work to get your blood flowing. You get hypertension, that elevated blood pressure. High blood pressure damages your kidneys. Damaged kidneys cause high blood pressure. It's a vicious circle. So when you jack one up, you jack the other up, and then it's just a vicious circle. One damages the other. Number four, dyslipidemia. It's a derangement in serum triglyceride, which is fat, and HDL, LDL cholesterol levels. In other words, those levels are too high for good health. Number five, and we've talked about this one quite a bit, inflammation. This is not a classical component of the metabolic syndrome, and it it's not used in most established definitions. I include it here because of the increasing recognition that metabolic syndrome involves chronic overactivation of cellular and biological defense mechanisms that cause pain and damage to tissues. Pain and damage to tissues. When you're overweight, think about how your knees feel. When, when you have to walk, or, or any of the joints that are load-bearing. Your hips, your knees, your ankles, your feet. And if you're not eating right, when you eat a lot of sugar, sugar causes inflammation in the body, and that inflammation is, is a precursor to a lot of these illnesses that we just you know talked about. Dr. Sullivan goes on to write, These miseries fill my days as an emergency phys physician. People who get sick and come to the emergency department are disproportionately fat, hypertensive, and diabetic. Disproportionately fat, hypertensive, and diabetic. That's because people who are fat, hypertensive, and diabetic are more, are more likely to get sick and in a vast variety of unpleasant ways. Think about this. Think about what you're doing to yourself if you're not taking care of your health. This may not be you yet, but it can easily become you if you're not taking care of yourself. It's so absurd when you hear people say, I don't do healthy. I, I couldn't think of anything more absurd than hearing somebody say that, but I've heard it. Brenda Sue's heard that. Uh, there's a lot of people say that, you know, you, you offer them some kind of healthy food. Oh, no, 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 I don't want that, you know. I'm, I'm, matter of fact, the fellow at church today was talking about, 
had a homeless guy out in the parking lot, or maybe not homeless, but a guy that the guy was begging. He's like, man, I'm hungry, you know. Uh, can you help me out with getting some food? The fellow says, well, certainly, you know, I can, I can, I can help you get, you know, some good, you know, some food. You know, we'll feed you. I'm a good Christian, you know. That's that's what we do. As good Christians, we, you know, we help others. So they start to go inside to Walmart. He's gonna buy him some, uh, you know, some bread and some lunch meat and some cheese and you know things like that, you know, to get him fed. And the guy stops him and says, "Oh no, no, no! My wife and I, all we eat is fast food." Is that crazy or what? How many people do you know out there just like that? That all they eat is fast food from the time they get up in the morning till the time they go to bed at night. Fast food all day, every day, seven days a week. I know people like that. I'm certain you know people like that. You might be like that. It's going to catch up to you. Somebody else is going to have to pick up the broken pieces behind your shattered life at some point. And if whoever has to pick up your broken pieces has a shattered life also, it could very well result in their having an even earlier demise than they would have otherwise because when you're a caretaker for somebody you have to be able to take care your, your health has to be good if you're a caretaker if your health isn't good it's going it's going to pull you right down because it is so highly stressful you have no if you've never done it you have no clue how highly stressful it can be to be a caretaker of another individual moving on People with metabolic syndrome or its components are more likely to become frail to suffer from stroke, cardiovascular disease, and heart attack, develop heart failure, to develop kidney failure, and to suffer from erectile dysfunction, depression, loss of independence, and premature death. How does this happen? The development of metabolic syndrome is complex and research into this nightmare is ongoing. Um, not going to read all of it to you, but most authorities focus heavily on obesity. So that's where we'll begin. Obesity. Obesity. The role of obesity in the development of metabolic syndrome is complex and complicated by the question of whether obesity itself has a casual role or whether obesity is a biomarker, an indicator of abnormal energy balance in overfed sedentary individuals. It does not appear to be the case that being fat itself always leads to, me to the metabolic syndrome. We all know people with some fat on their frame who are nevertheless active, vital, and vibrant. They carry some weight around, but they glow with good health. Moreover, obesity is itself multifactorial, encompassing genetic, lifestyle, environmental, psychosocial, and cultural issues. These complex associations are worthy of a book or two in themselves, but for our purposes, it really boils down to how our behavior affects our weight because our genetics and our cultural milieu are more or less beyond our control. We can't help the families we're born into, you know. Uh, but we don't have to live the way our families have lived. We can always be the one that breaks that chain of unhealthy lifestyles. The behaviors that affect our weight are what we eat, how much we eat, and how much energy we burn off through physical work and exercise. Calories in, calories out. If you want to have a healthy body fat percentage, you have to consume fewer calories than you burn. Weight loss is truly that simple of a complex. Uh, you know, when you... So many people make weight loss into something far more than it has to be. They complicate the, the issue. It's not a complex problem. You have to burn fewer calories, or you have to consume fewer calories 
then you burn. There's going to be some people out there, you know, there, there are some medical exceptions. I'm going to give you that. There are some medical exceptions, but for, for the vast majority of us, those medical exceptions don't apply. We eat too much, we gain too much weight. It is simple as that. So if you want to take the weight off, you have to eat fewer calories than you, than you uh, burn. So, anyway, he's talking about the brother Phil again. Phil, sedentary, overfed lifestyle creates a derangement in energy balance leading to the accumulation of unhealthy visceral fat and a reduction in the sensitivity of his body's tissues to insulin. Insulin resistance is at the core of the metabolic syndrome. When you're eating that sugar all the time, uh, you get insulin resistant. Your body can either quit producing enough insulin or it just becomes resistant to this insulin. You need your body to be insulin sensitive. 